Welcome back to the Top Notch Documentaries YouTube channel. In today's video I should be covering the infamous bandit trio known as the Stopwatch Gang. I hope you enjoy. Three Canadians terrorised banks in both the United States and Canada for many years. The trio, which was soon dubbed as the Stopwatch Gang, stole from an astronomical amount of banks, roughly 140 in total. With the total amount stolen over the course of their bank robbery careers, hitting just over an estimated $15 million. They were calculated, experienced, and well trained for bank robberies. The gang consisted of the three Canadians, whose names were Paddy Mitchell, Lionel Wright, and Stephen Reed. A close knit trio of bandits were very knowledgeable of each other's strengths and weaknesses. There was a strong sense of trust amongst them because of their chosen profession, and their strong bond led to some of the craziest situations, which will be revealed later on. The trio met by chance for the most part, but also in the way that many criminal groups form by individuals' reputations. Their evolution from being small-time criminals to large criminal players on a gigantic scale would take place from the early 70s, 1973 to be precise, through into the 1980s. Paddy Mitchell was the brains and getaway driver. He had an underworld reputation in Canada prior to the trio forming. Lionel Wright was all about details and he was the most knowledgeable member, being able to recall information which proved useful information for the robberies. And finally, Stephen Reed. Stephen Reed was the most notable for being the escape artist of the group, along with being the most streetwise and assertive member. He was a drug addict and armed bank robber. He was actually on the run when he met the pair, having escaped from the law whilst on a day pass. He was two years into a 10 year sentence for robbery. Mitchell and Reed would meet. As mentioned, Reed was on the run from the law. He had been put in contact with Mitchell by a prison pal. On meeting Mitchell, Reed complimented his beautiful suede jacket, and this jacket compliment was reciprocated by Mitchell, giving Reed the same jacket in his fitting. The bond had been sealed. Mitchell was already a criminal, like Reed. At the time of meeting Reed, he was acting as an aluminium salesman to divert attention away from his criminal activity. Mitchell had met Wright at a smoke shop the year prior to meeting Reed. Mitchell often went there as it was on his truck delivery route. He drove a soda delivery truck for 10 years. The pair began chatting and Mitchell mentioned his love of a specific whiskey. Following more chance encounters, the pair became friends and kept talking until Mitchell was fired from his delivery job. Months passed and Wright decided to call Mitchell. In the call he recalled details about the whiskey and asked Mitchell if he still enjoyed drinking it. The chance encounter had led to another fate being sealed. Wright worked at a trucking company and said that he had two cases of that very whiskey. It wouldn't be missed. This led to a business deal in between Mitchell and Wright, with Wright stealing trucking goods and fencing them to Mitchell. The operation was successful, with forged, with forged documentation being used to hide the origins of the goods, and with there being a big market for stolen property, plenty of money was made. The operation was successful for a while. However, Wright's trucking company soon noticed that something was amiss and caught on to the scheme. Truckloads of goods were now going missing, not just two cases of whiskey. The company fired Wright. Mitchell went to look for other similar lucrative operations because he no longer had revenue from the scheme. He couldn't find any and stated that he couldn't go back to a 9 to 5 because he had very expensive habits by this point. Around this time frame Mitchell met the fugitive Reed and Reed was invited into the pair's world. The next year had the trio doing whatever it took to make money. Delivery networks were targeted, 
with the skills mentioned earlier being employed to successfully and efficiently pick and rob delivery vehicles. The trio would then use the money taken to splash out on their respective habits. This was sometimes as much as $30,000 for a day's takings. April 17, 1974, breaking news hit about a heist at Canada's Ottawa airport. It was late at night as an airport warehouse employee waited patiently for an Air Canada employee who was scheduled to arrive to pick up an order. Flights were on the line because of the important pickup of plane de fluid and the ramifications for not successfully exchanging the pickup was going to be harsh for the unfortunate warehouse employee who had been made to complete the deal. Suddenly there was a knock on the door. The employee let the man in. It was Reed. What quickly went from fear of being fired turned to fear of being shot. As Reed told the employee the unforgettable words, this is a robbery. If you don't do everything I tell you, I'll have to kill you. The airport warehouse held some serious value. It contained gold bars weighing in at 5,100 ounces. The employee complied with Reed, but didn't have access to the key, which unlocked the cage where the gold sat. Reed grabbed some nearby tools and managed to excavate the gold from the cage, proceeding to move it to the getaway car, containing both Mitchell and Wright. Six gold bars worth more than $750,000 were taken from the warehouse. The news article says 165000 but that wasn't the actual value. The bars were heavy, and the bandits knew their worth. Today, the amount would have been around $4 million total. The April heist would signal the starting career of one of the most successful bandit trios in history spanning two countries and hundreds of banks. Police were both stunned and annoyed at the robbery, the biggest heist in Canadian history, and they needed to solve this one fast. It didn't take long. They turned to the theory that it was an inside job. How else did the robbers know the exact time when the gold would be in the warehouse? Precision timing wasn't very believable to the authorities, the unknown bandits weren't fortune tellers. They soon found the tip giver, who agreed to leak the whole storyline. He told the authorities everything, but they needed more. The authorities needed Mitchell, who had paid the tipster for information, to be caught, because words didn't mean much. It would arrive in 1975, with a drugged suitcase interception. Authorities went in for Mitchell's arrest along with taking him right for drug smuggling charges also. They both got 17 years, with Mitchell being given an extra 3 years for having the gold bars and conspiracy to sell them at a future date. Reed had left Canada following the airport heist, but soon returned because he'd run out of money. He was soon caught, was given 10 years extra. He still had his original sentence to serve. May sound like the trio were done. Long sentences ahead and no way out. But this insane story wasn't over yet. Not satisfied with the sentences, with little left to lose, the escapes began. Wright was walking the prison yard one day when a man left the woods in sight of the barbed wire fences. The lone guard keeping watch was surprised as he was ambushed by the man who pulled out a gun and made him drop his. He chucked a bag over the prison fence, which contained wire cutters. Other inmates, whom he likely came to rescue, used these to cut a hole in the fence and flee. On seeing this lucky opportunity, Wright fled alongside them. He left Canada and headed down to Florida. Chill and Reed took a different approach, using good behaviour to open up doors for themselves. A warden actually commented on Mitchell's positive behaviour, talking about his exemplary behaviour and participation in social programmes. It was all for show. They both just wanted to escape. Reed began hairstyling in the prison. That was how he got another day pass out of the prison. It is insane. He escaped from a police escort and fled to a holiday inn to meet a getaway man. 
The Holiday Inn was actually running a police convention at the time. He made it out of there, heading into the nearby city and would soon begin robbing banks all over again. He had promised to help spring Mitchell from the joint. The money was going to be used to fund the next escape and to live away from the clutches of the law. This didn't happen because Mitchell found a better method. Mitchell faked an injury as a means to being transferred to a hospital. On arrival, men in surgical masks and scrubs took control of the guards and helped Mitchell into the getaway car. All three bandits were now free. Mitchell and Reed knew that Canada was too hot to reside in. The law would be after them and they needed somewhere to lie low. Florida. The idea likely came from Wright, who had offered to help out in the escape, but Reed informed him that it would be better for him to maintain his low profile in Florida. He had gotten a job and was living under the radar. Mitchell's hair now dyed, and with fake IDs, they crossed the Canadian-American border. They were now in Burlington, Vermont. They then flew from New York to Florida and met back up with Wright. Smash and grab robberies followed in the coming months and the trio settled into their life on the run in Florida. They set up in St. Petersburg by the beach. Not long after arriving, they planned to rob a bank inside of a Tampa department store and this soon went ahead. With the trio anticipating the event and going over strategy, the plan soon went into motion. The teller immediately handed over bags of money as the customers stared in bewilderment and confusion. Mitchell, the usual getaway driver, had just as much confusion plastered on his face. It was the first time that he'd ever held a gun on a robbery. The gun's trigger actually ended up giving him a wedgie. Reed described the robbery later on as a comedy sketch. Florida had helped the trio to better understand how to perfect the art of bank robbery. They drove to different areas in Florida and did their reconnaissance of different targets. Before a robbery, the gang stole a car, swapped the stolen car's plates and parked it, usually in an underground parking lot. Wright, the detailed bandit, traversed the escape routes and would recall potential alleyways or hidden areas along the escape route to elude detection. Robbery over and the crew split. Multiple cars awaiting their return. Money arrived back at the safe house and the crew went back to their normal routines. With many banks having been robbed in Florida, the level of attention to the area became a cause for concern. The trio knew that it was only a matter of time before they could be unmasked. Too many robberies and the bigger authorities would soon come snooping about. Much like with Canada, they made the decision to transfer locations. California was their ideal destination, a huge state, much like Florida, and it was on the opposite end of the country, much like with Florida and Canada. It was the ideal spot to continue the profitable robberies. A beachfront house was picked as the main hub in San Diego and the trio went back to lapsing up the sun and lapsing up the illegal funds. They hit banks in LA County and drove up to San Francisco to scope and target even more. San Diego was the place to be for their crimes. It was a wealthy location and the bandit trio made the most out of it. It would be in San Diego where the trio would receive the infamous nickname. The FBI nickname came from a bank witness who watched as the robbers made off in less than 90 seconds with one of the bandits, most of the time it was Stephen Reed, monitoring the time via a stopwatch. The bank robberies quickly stacked up, with takings being in the five figures for each bank robbery. Apart from one, where they made off with 
$8,210 from a Bank of America branch. The bandits were displayed on national TV, the robberies bringing in plenty of media attention. The attention soon led to the breakup of the trio for a while. The attention and pressures of a life of crime seemed to cause insurmountable stress within the tight-knit group. Being on the run was a challenge, and that paired with frequent robberies was making life difficult. I just wanted to clarify that it was Mitchell who felt this way. Wright and Reed stuck it out and moved across the US, hitting banks in Arkansas and Arizona. But with fates having already been sealed, Mitchell, whether bored or with nowhere else to go, made the decision to return to his pals in 1980. The bandit trio back together, much like a boy band after a breakup. It was clear that they were looking for a similar connection, a high of sorts. They all desperately wanted to go legit, but they all wanted a big score to help them do this. No amount of money ever seemed to be enough. The trio would soon agree on a bank. It was a Bank of America branch in San Diego. The bank was soon scoped out and a plan was put into action. Wright secured a getaway car, a rented dark blue Ford and a red stripe was applied to it by Mitchell. He was the getaway driver after all. This smart decision was to throw off the law with witnesses likely to easily remember the standout ride. Reed focused on guard routines and movement. They knew that an armoured truck would arrive to bring in money to the bank. The time finally came when the robbery was to be committed. It was September the 23rd. Both Reed and Wright wore suits and wigs. Reed laughed and joked that Wright looked like an anorexic Colonel Sanders. The pair waited and waited. Where was the truck? It was 28 minutes late. Typical. The pair were sweating but remained calm and stayed put. They were in too deep to cancel the plan. The armoured truck guard arrived with delivery of money, making multiple trips back and forth, bringing in coins and such. He soon brought in the cash and Reed made his move. He aimed a 357 Magnum at the guard and repeated his Ottawa airport heist line. The robbery became instant news, the biggest bank heist in San Diego history, identical to the Canadian airport heist. The stopwatch gang couldn't escape the media attention. They had stolen $283,000. In a cruel twist of fate following the robbery, an elderly couple searching for aluminium cans found the bank disguises in a dumpster DNA evidence from Wiggs and the photo used to rent the getaway car were soon uncovered. This marked the beginning of the end for the Bandit Trio. Celebrating the successful heist, the Bandit Trio cheered and enjoyed the prospect of a bank robbery free future. With 30 banks hit in California, they could become smugglers and engage in far less risky trades. That prospect sounded great until October of 1980, the same year, when the law stepped onto the stage. The FBI was onto the stopwatch gang. A confidential informant had exposed the names to the FBI and they were closing in, fast. DNA evidence from the dumpster find had led to their real identities being found. The FBI knew all about their pasts and upon arresting Wright and Reed, held them on 1.5 million dollar bonds so they couldn't flee. In 1981, Wright and Reed pled guilty and were hit with 20 years in federal prison in America. The two were kept separate, constantly in a transfer state from prison to prison. In 1983, they were extradited back to Canada. Mitchell was still running and on learning about his bank buddy's arrests ended up going on a solo bank robbery career. Absolutely wild if you ask me. He was soon on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list when he was caught after a failed department store hold up. 
They didn't learn about his identity and he was given a $16,000 bond and someone flew into Arizona for him to actually pay it. He was let free and continued taking over banks. Did he know that his luck was soon to run out and so was just digging himself deeper into the ground? Who knows? He was certainly making the most of his time on the lam. Still, his time soon ran out. He was caught in Florida, extradited to California and given 48 years for different robberies. However, just four years into the sentence, he escaped again. I guess he took after Reed. Honestly, all three were just as brilliant when it came to escaping. He made it out and fled abroad to Asia and ended up starting a new life there, wife and all. He even took trips back to America to rob more banks. I don't even know what to say at this point. This case is just insane. In 1993, his face had been plastered all over the news and crime channels by this point. He was told on, but when agents actually reached his home, he had fled again. He returned to America and would rob his final ever bank in Mississippi. Everything he had learned was put into play and he called in a bomb threat with the aim of moving police attention away from the bank. It might have worked if it had been in the 70s or 80s, but law enforcement was by now familiar with the tactic. On leaving the bank, he was found almost immediately and was soon given 65 years. He didn't make it out this time. Whilst Mitchell was running wild, Reed was in prison and ended up getting married whilst in the can. On release from prison, he taught creative writing and had managed to rehabilitate himself, well, for a while. He wanted to become a better writer, but felt like the people around him were just using him for his old reputation. He became depressed and fell into drug use, ending up partaking in one final bank robbery. He was caught not long after and given an additional 18 years. Reed began to confront his past and recalled being sexually abused as a child. It led him down the road of drug taking and that escalated into robberies. Reed stated that I'm sure it didn't help me, but I've always believed we live in the arena of choices and I've made a lot of choices that led me to right now. Reed said about the robberies, we live like rock stars and we had a great time. Reed and Mitchell kept in contact over the years. Mitchell, still in prison, wrote a final letter to Reed, writing, We've had a life, haven't we? He died not long after, in 2007. Right upon his 1994 prison release, didn't stay in contact. Mitchell died in 2018. And sure, the trio got away with plenty of cash and were successful in terms of hold-ups. However, their actions had serious consequences. They were on the run for the vast amount of time on their spree. And they were handed down insanely long prison sentences once being caught. I'm certain that there was plenty of regret alongside the adrenaline fueled excitement. Do you agree? Please be sure to give me your thoughts on the Stopwatch Gang. As always, thanks for watching.